Hello, everybody. Hi, this is Davey. Um, so let's get started. Um, there are some things that I'll be talking about, all kinds of things. Uh, so probably we'll, there'll be a lot of information, but uh, definitely ask questions at the end, and hopefully I can help you out and clarify some things. So things that will be that I'll be talking about today. Um, who are compositors, right? Uh, what are the type of artists, or what are the type of the people that kind of uh, gravitate to compositing, and um, other backgrounds that they come from? There are certain some skills that definitely relate to compositing, and a lot of people kind of um, have an interest in that in comparison to doing 3D type of work or uh, CG lighting, which you heard a bit uh, more about from. Uh, Mark's webinar before. Uh, then I'll be talking about what is compositing. So we'll get into a little bit more detail about exactly what is compositing for visual effects. Sometimes people get confused a bit about what exactly that entails. We'll uh, go into Nuke for just very briefly, just show you just some images that, about layering and bringing those together. So not necessarily a tutorial, but just to kind of show you the interface. Um, also, some other things about if you know After Effects, a lot of uh, my students who come in no After Effects, um, and they kind of go, well, I'm now ready to take my shot to the next level, and why? Like, what, what's the appeal, and things like that. So I'll kind of talk a bit about that as well. And also as well, uh, the visual effects pipeline. That's very important to really understand where does compositing fit into the whole picture, and uh, what other kinds of things happen before the compositor gets all uh, of his or her elements, and what kinds of things really um, are important about integrating the role of the compositor into the rest of the whole visual effects uh, type of pipeline, so whether for broadcast or for TV. Um, and then, of course, we'll be talking a little bit about the basic skills. I mean, those are kind of certainly the aspects of what is compositing and things like that. But um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, entry-level positions in the industry and what's important and what kinds of things in general people want to look for your reels. Um, and that's really at the end, so I'll top it off, kind of training your eye, what's important. I think what are, what are the fun things as well, and what are the other important things to do as you're practicing it, as you're trying to build your skills. So let's talk about the first role. Who are compositors? Right? Um, a lot of people come from a whole different background, um, certainly. Um, generally, obviously, a creative background, that certainly helps. Um, anything that understands good understanding of color, composition, hence the compositor, right? A lot of times the elements that you're given are certainly uh, decided upon in advance. You know, put this cloud here, put this mountain here, those things like that. But it's your integration, you know, how you're integrating that new sky that you're, you're placing in. Those kinds of things are all very related to actual photography and what the lens is doing or what the, how the lens is photographing a scene. So a lot of photographers uh, come into compositing um, and then obviously have that sort of um, skill of looking at a whole shot, the, how the composition is laid out. You know, where have they put the camera? Do they put it a little to the right, to the left? Um, how are the tonalities, the color palette, things like that? All different kind of classic things that photographers try to look at. All of those aspects uh, really get to be very important as a compositor for visual effects. It's all the same thing. It's just that your shot is moving at that point. And obviously the elements in there are moving as well. Um, also, Photoshop artists as well, classically, you're layering things, you're bringing all different elements uh, together from all different sources, those are very important as well, and uh, that high idea of integrating as well, and again, imitating what a lens shoots. Your, your object as a compositor is to try to get all of those elements to really match together and to seem like they were actually photographed in real life at the same time even if it's an alien, even if it's something that you don't think really uh, is logically correct or realistic, it still has to be believable for, your, for the audience to, 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 to buy that shot, in a sense. Um, also, matte painters as well. Uh, a lot of matte painters come in and they go, well, I've done matte painting and now I want to take, again, the shot a step further and try and do some more um, animated or take their, their matte painting and create a bit more dimension and add some projections and uh, add a camera move to that as well. And then certainly add more moving elements, fire, smoke, uh, green screen elements, things like that. 
Those are all very kind of uh, interesting elements to really bring to life that matte painting, to make it dynamic. Right? Matte paintings are a beautiful craft, but they need to be brought to life when they're put into a moving shot, and certainly for into a visual effect shot. Um, I've also had some more students more recently come in from a photo retouching background as well. That's quite common, so related to Photoshop artists as well. And that has been a very kind of interesting task because they have quite a very good, strong sense of detail, um, also a very good sense of cutting out objects and rotoscoping and dealing with very specific edges. So um, those kinds of artists then are taking those skills a next step further and starting to work on moving images as well. Um, and certainly, of course, After Effects artists. So those who are familiar with uh, either the basic ideas of compositing or want to then, uh, who have done motion graphics, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in general, um, and bringing their, those skills in to apply it to a much um, more advanced software like Nuke for film and TV effects. Um, 3D artists, of course, or CG lighters, so general 3D artists, maybe modelers or texture painters or um, other types of 3D skills and tasks. They come in going, well, I've done a bit of 3D, I enjoy it, but I also want to find out what compositing is about. All those kinds of ideas come together. Uh, the way that Nuke really these days is sort of bringing the world or uh, the role if you want, of compositors uh, a bit of that is starting to blend. There are projections and other types of 3D aspects, if you're familiar with those. Um, that can be done in Maya, but now can also be done in Nuke to a certain extent and a very realistic way as well. And part of what is important about a visual effects supervisor and the whole pipeline or the whole picture of visual effects, whether 3D or 2D, is to look at a shot, decide on the elements, and decide which is best for the 3D artist or the 3D department to do and which is best for the compositing department to do. So um, that will save a lot of time. It will save a lot of um, render time, certainly, and a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, creative effort on each department. Each part is doing what they're best at doing and bring, to bring everything together into the shop. Um, also programmers as well who have come from sort of a media arts programming background as well. They've come in. Um, Knowing Python eventually in your career, it could be helpful as well to it's just add, it's going to add more skills and allow you to create more custom types of tools and custom setups in Nuke, which is very handy. But that, as a junior starting out, that's fine if you don't know it. Um, eventually, you'll be, you'll come across it and you'll find that you really enjoyed it because it will help you make your, uh, your, your workflow basically a lot easier and a lot faster. And, of course, any kind of creative artist. I've had animators come in, stop-motion animators come in. So anybody who's got, you know, that strong creative eye, you're looking at a shot in terms of all different aspects. So let's talk a bit about what is compositing, right? There are um, a variety of different types of compositing, and here's sort of an initial list. But just to kind of talk about the, the basic starting point of that is that it's layering, right? It is layering, and it's then integrating those varied elements into a moving image. Sure, your camera may be a lock-off. That's a possibility as well. But it's still about creating, it's not a still image. It's about hair moving, even if the camera's not. Or it's about, obviously, the camera moving and getting those new elements to track in. A lot of the time, uh, it could be about chroma keying. For this example here, where you see on the top part, you see a green screen um, that was shot on set, or sorry, that was shot in the studio. And you've got markers in the background and some markers in the front to actually uh, create some camera tracking information so that we can put a new background behind there. This shot was actually done by one of my students who was um, studying for the master's program here. And uh, put, he put a lot of work into this and uh, showed it came out really, really well. He maintained a lot of detail in the hair, uh, which is quite tricky sometimes. And uh, since she's wearing a kind of a uh, jacket that has very rough sort of fur edges. Um, a lot of detail there is very hard to maintain. So chroma keying is not just pulling the straight key and then you slap it over the background. This, it's all about that integration again of that edge detail. The background in this particular case was actually built from in, uh, individual stills. Uh, some of it was one photograph and then the background uh, in the city was a different photograph and all different textures. The uh, 
fence in the front, the no trespass, trespass sign in the front, things like that. All these different stills that were then uh, applied, or if you will, projected onto geometry that was set up into the scene. And then a 3D background, sort of a 3D environment was created and then rendered out and worked and then composited together and integrated with the foreground element. So you're looking for matching of lighting, all kinds of different things, tonality, um, color grading, the element in the foreground to get rid of any of that green spill that's on her jacket and on her face, all those types of elements that go into keying. Um, CG compositing as well is another very common thing, and I'll show you just a bit of those in Nuke as well after this. Um, CG compositing renders that are from the 3D department that are all brought together. And we get the renders, the 2D renders, and then again, integrating those into the shot. Quite often, the color or the tonality is very close because they're obviously lighting it and texturing it to match into a plate. So, for instance, say, to match into this green screen plate or a different background plate. And uh, then our role is then, again, to integrate it. Maybe there's light wrap. So adding all those sort of photographic type of details that are you would normally get when you shoot a photograph, you know, certainly lens flares to a certain extent. Um, uh, let's see, light wrap, things like that. Um, then as well, set extensions are another kind of compositing. So quite often they have a set that was actually shot in the studio with the actor, a uh, physically built set, and then you have green screen on the very top part. So they're not going to build the whole top of Hogwarts Castle, right, at the very, very tip. Um, so a lot, the rest of that would be done, built, modeled, textured, et cetera, in the 3D department. It was then light, lit, and then rendered out and then brought into Nuke, and the compositor then integrates that top CG extension into the actual live-action plate, the rest of the model that was actually shot on the green screen set. Those are very common types of things now, set extensions. Also, the set extensions can be for uh, models as well, miniatures. That's very common, too. Miniatures are still being used, not as common as they used to be. But uh, the amount of detail and certain effect shots, uh, certain types of explosions, things like that, um, those types of things are still shot on a model, very large model, perhaps. But still, uh, it gives a lot of benefits that um, maybe CG or certain directors may, want, may not want to do in CG as well. Um, crowd duplication, too. Uh, you've got a huge stadium. You've got a lot of people uh, that need to fill the stadium. You're not going to hire, you know, a 1,000 or more uh, extras on set. That's quite expensive. Um, so you hire maybe 20 people, and then you put them in different groups, all kind of staggered throughout the uh, shot and throughout the stadium, and then basically group them, hopefully change their clothes so you don't have too many repeated kind of patterns, and then composite all those different groups together. So where they overlap things like that, um, you'll have to then sort out kind of rotoscoping and getting all that layering to work. And again, integration, lighting direction, things like that. So generally crowd duplication is shot with that very specific idea in mind. Um, you probably notice quite a lot of films that crowd duplication, a lot of crowds are now CG as well. So that could be another thing. Then again, CG comping, integrating the CG crowd renders into your possible crowd duplication. So as you see, a lot of things start to really overlap, which is kind of fun. Uh, particle effects integration. So that's certainly adding um, effects types of elements, dynamics, water, fire. They're all rendered uh, from the 3D departments, from what they call, the artist is called the effects TD, or effects technical director. Um, those are kind of fun elements because they're generally uh, pretty interesting looking and hopefully quite realistic if they're aiming for a very realistic water splash or um, type of fire element or if you've got some more creative, interesting type of creatures made out of particles or dissolve, things like that, uh, Death Eaters and Potter films. Things like that. Those are very classic kind of elements that you'd be compositing into your shot. So in a sense, they are CG renders, but generally those kind of uh, uh, effects kind of need a different type of treatment. Um, Again, integration, getting, I think one of the hardest things about particle effects is to really kind of understand, to get depth into that, that element, to not have it feel very flat. Depth and also transparency, a sense of um, 
density or how the edges are, especially for smoke and things like that. Uh, rotoscoping, a uh, very common thing as well. So that is one of the main entry level, one of the main skills that uh, is very necessary to master at the beginning. And to really get uh, a good understanding of how you're cutting out an element and how you're, what's the best way, what's the fastest way, what's the most um, accurate way, things like that. Um, those edges have to be very accurate, uh, especially if you're doing some very high-res elements like uh, high-res films like um, Dark Knight Rises, you know, which is uh, IMAX. Some, some of those plates are IMAX, 5.6K. Um, a lot of detail. Sometimes pretty scary, but also very, very exciting to work on those types of plates as well. Um, also, stereo conversion is requiring a lot of rotoscoping, cutting out the different elements, bringing those all together. Uh, those are also very important. Uh, roto skills to really master. And then as well, uh, rig, uh, rig and wire removal, right? Um, so rotoscoping and uh, rig removal are really some of the main core types of entry-level skills that a lot of compositors uh, tend to get work in at the beginning. And as you start to build those skills and show your work and um, advance to more difficult shots in both rotoscoping and rig removal, then you start to get into other shots of chroma keying. Um, so as as you're sort of building your own skills within a particular company or in freelance type of work, you're sort of proving yourself and then begin being given more difficult shots and start building to more um, complex types of scenes where you're really integrating maybe all of these types of characteristics, chroma keying, CG comping, sets, extensions, particles, roto, rig, everything all into one shot at one time. Okay, so we've talked about what is compositing in different types, and um, we've then sort of, uh, actually, let me think, I'm going to switch over to Nuke, actually, for a second before I come back to this After Effects. So, we are in Nuke here. This is Nuke 7.0. I'm just going to do a very basic kind of um, show you a few different elements that are put together for a particular shot. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but I'll just be basically loading these elements into here. Um, as you see, one of the main differences between Nuke and After Effects is that it's a uh, Nuke is a nodal compositor, which is every single node, this is an image that's brought in, every single operation that I do, a blur or a merge to bring two elements together, needs to be an actual node. So if I take one element here and I add a blur node to that, that's a filter process and bring my setting up. You can obviously see before and after I then added that blur filter or that blur operation. So very quickly your script can start to build into a very interesting kind of Mondrian-esque, if you will, type of setup with a bit of circuit board kind of looking thing. So everything's going to start to link. You can have multiple outputs of an image and use that in multiple ways. One version can be blurred, another version maybe not. You combine those two, one's color corrected, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Things like that that really start to build. But I'll delete this for right now and I'll start to show you. Uh, these are just some elements that I'll go through quickly that start to uh, show you a compositing taster. We do this shot in the compositing taster days um, here at Escape during the day and um, then also, uh, we're going to be developing, we are developing, it's nearly done actually, a, um online version. So if you are not in London and you wanted to kind of find out well, what is compositing about and get a kind of much more of a hands-on type of situation with Nuke and with compositing, you'll have a chance to do this shot but actually take it a bit further than what we do in the daytime. And you'll get a chance to kind of use these elements to create, I'll show you this type of composite. So this is one version of the final at the end. This has, uh, and then actually I'll show you, then another version. So this was from a Doctor Who show. And you can see the sort of light, light wrap differences and nice kind of god rays. I'll go full screen on this. And you can see that there's um, different levels that you can take your shot. So this is sort of an initial 
uh, bringing all the elements together type of comp, so a bit more than a rough comp, integrating some things, color correcting some things. I'll show you the, the individual elements. And then take the shot even further, add some nice light rays, some glows. Um, again, you're imitating what a photographer is aiming for, or what a, a photograph does, and what a lens does, and camera does. You know, light wrapping around, bright highlights wrapping around, they only exist in certain types of areas. Um, how do light rays react? Are they occluded? Are they causing shadows? All these types of things about integrating the whole shot together. So some of the elements, for instance, that are part of this is uh, these are some of the matte painting elements. We have a render here with an alpha channel. Oh, this one doesn't actually have an alpha channel. Normally, there's an alpha channel. Um, if you don't have an alpha channel, this was CG render, then you may be given a separate render. And these will individually give you some mats that you may need. Hopefully, you don't have to s sit here and actually cut out frame by frame or by spline those individual elements if they're coming from the 3D department. That geometry is built already. And then quite easily, you can get some mats for that. And use those mats to color correct, things like that. You may uh, hear some other elements that initially are rendered out that you start to bring together to create the TARDIS element. And combining these passes, that's what we go through in understanding how to combine those to create your final look. Here's the original people pass as well. So they are on a the similar um, pattern, the similar floor, which is good. That, that helps to integrate. But obviously, they are in a very different color space and different, very different color than the final. So comping those in and then getting those actually to really integrate as well. So I was talking about the uh, green screen as well, pulling a key from that, doing your basic keys. There's a lot of different ways to do that as well. So pulling some basic mats, a prime mat is one of them. And then I'm just doing a quick comp over the checkerboard. And you see there's still quite a lot of that green spill coming from the green background. That happens quite often, especially with white elements. So bringing that all together, you see, OK, once I get my final background, I'm still going to have some problems color correcting. I need to deal with that. I've got a bit of an edge here. I may be losing some detail on the hair, things like that. Or my mat may start to kind of what they call boil, be very noisy in those very transparent areas. So bringing all those together with your final background, again, will be very important. So this, again, is that example of the final shot. And this was the beginning of that shot. So the camera is moving around and then revealing, eventually, the back scene. So all of these elements were created um, in combination, mostly in Nuke, a little bit of um, building, a little bit of basic uh, model building in Maya, but nothing terribly complex. And now Nuke has its own model builder as well, so you can do some fairly basic things in there. And combining those, so really bringing together the shot. Here's a good example of rig removal. So here's the original plate. You've got the prop guys here holding up all the elements and wires, pulling everything. The final commercial, this is for Kerry Cheese, uh, had CG characters, sort of cartoon Disney-like characters uh, dancing around and moving the actual elements on the set, too. So removing all those wires requires a bit of work. Getting that back plate to really match is really tricky. Getting the perspective and things like that to match. These are all types of rig removal shots. And then, of course, the whole side of Nuke, of 3D side of Nuke. There's obviously the 2D side, which everybody's fairly familiar with and from After Effects type of use. But then as you get into further advanced, more advanced skills, understanding uh, Nuke and using the 3D elements, so you can bring in cameras from Maya and other software as well, animated cameras, or you can generate a camera in here. And you can have different geometry. I've just ch chosen some basic primitives here. And you can project or put images onto those. For instance, the ever famous color bars, things like that. So these are just some very basic examples, but you have this opens up your whole world to creating, as I was talking about, those 3D environments, such as in the other shot, 
the student work done, um, or set extensions. You may get very more complex geometry, certainly other than primitives, and you have textures that are basically um, are specifically built for those particular geometry, and you can then remap those and apply those, and then add your additional uses in there. So it's not meant to replace Maya. It's not meant to replace a 3D artist role, but it's, that again, and, uh, to really embellish what we can do as a compositor and to add on to what we need to do in the shot. All right. So very, very handy types of skills. Those, All of these skills will help bring together um, a shot and make it a really good final element. So let's go back to this. Um, so if you come from an After Effects background, which um, some students have, this is the majority, but not everybody, um, you kind of go, well, I know After Effects, I've composited After Effects and things like that. Well, why should I learn Nuke? Um, there's a variety of reasons, certainly. Uh, one of them is certainly that it is an industry standard software for film and video right now. Um, certainly for film, uh, most companies are using Nuke. There are some companies maybe using other software like Fusion. Fusion quite often is being used for stereo conversion as well. Uh, but it is pretty much now everybody internationally is using Nuke to composite different elements. Um, you may come from a lot of After Effects artists come from a motion graphics background. So they may have done a bit of compositing, but they've kind of been mostly generating graphics and then applying those into the shot or compositing those into their shot, tracking them in, things like that. Um, that's great. There's a very uh, sort of more design-oriented skill related to that, but I think visual effects is a little bit less design, graphic design-oriented, and the tools in, visual, in, in Nuke are really not designed for doing motion graphics. You, know, you can't bend type in the same way and that in, in a very easy way like you would in Photoshop or After Effects. The tools in After Effects are really, really well designed for that, and obviously those are the main software that everybody's using. But um, visual effects requires other different types of skills in addition to what you probably have normally done in After Effects. So it's giving you a lot more controls, giving you a lot more options. As you saw, the projections going into 3D, um, I think that you may struggle with that a bit in, other in, in After Effects and certainly Photoshop. You can uh, fake it or sort of have its own, they have its own way, but I think you'll find that the speed and the render times as well start to kind of get in the way. And this gives you, Nuke is going to give you the full 3D set, so allowing you to really get perspective very easily on an element once it's applied into the scene. Um, and also high and visual effects really require tremendous amounts of detail, such as like this photograph from Prometheus. Um, the type of elements that you'd be getting, CG renders, uh, smoke elements that were shot on set or shot in a studio over black, things like that, um, all kinds of different, a variety of different elements that you've got to really bring up to a very, very high standard because obviously these are being projected very large and it's the amount of detail, it's the realism that you're aiming for. Um, After Effects can certainly do that, but I think it just takes a lot longer. And again, you don't have that full control and the amount of tools at your fingertips to be able to um, integrate those two at that extreme level. So those are kind of some things that I think a lot of people sort of come in and then wanting to shift and they go, ah, okay, now I can take my shot even further and, and work on some really cool big master shots. So talking about the visual effects pipeline, uh, where does compositing sit in this whole thing? Right? Um, if you can see my cursor, it's down towards the bottom on the lower right. right? Um, not to say that we are one of the last departments that a, the elements go through, which is exciting and also can be frustrating, of course. You know, a lot of the elements that have been rendered out prior may take a bit longer than expected as usual and then it sort of ends up um, on our plate and we have to bring those all together sometimes in a very quick way in order to get that shot out for the client. But you know it usually depends obviously on the project and on the type, the amount of time you have and the amount of elements you're, not, you're needing to bring together. But in brief it's pretty much for starting at the very top your art department's creating the concept work. Uh, the shoot certainly happens as well. So they're creating the green screens and all the different plates and your background elements, your smoke elements, things like that. 
that's all going to previs as well. They're deciding um, to an extent before the shoot as well, partially what are the camera moves. Right? So that's a bit of back and forth as well. The R&D department is then in the post house deciding how are we going to build this alien? How are we going to build this ship? All right? What are the tools? Do we have tools? Can we, do we need to create some new additional tools? You know, we've never built uh, a ship with fur. I, you know, what, those kinds of things. All kinds of crazy things that every single film, you know, certainly the big summer blockbuster films that we all enjoy, are out to really push that kind of visual effects envelope and also the technology and push it even further, make water even look more realistic and do some crazy things. Um, all of those types that R&D then gets uh, fed over to the assets department or the modeling department, the shading department, rigging, and the texture department. Um, all of those elements then get put into the full post-production sort of pipeline. All right. Each of them are getting approved by the visual effects supervisor or the heads of the department, the 3D supervisor, and to a certain extent, the 2D supervisor. And then all of those are getting approved in a dailies process. So they're looking at that every single stage. They're saying, yes, we like that. No, the fur is not quite working over the headlights. Take off the fur, you know, things like that. Those crazy kinds of decisions. Um, they do make log logical decisions as well. But <laughs> anyway, um, the film that has been shot, that comes in, that needs to get scanned. We need our plates. We need all, all of our smoke and things like that. All of that's brought together. The pre-vis has now been converted to a post-vis because some of that modeling and texturing has been initially built. And the creature, the ships, whatever, have then been initially put together. So they're now doing rough comps and creating the post-vis for the director to see. The cameras need to be generated from the plates to create a 3D virtual camera of what actually shot the plate, unless there's obviously motion control data. That's always helpful. And then certainly at the same time, the rotoscoping department and the matte painters are getting some of those plates as well. The rotoscoping takes quite a while, and that's something that they have to really start on right away to cut out the individual elements. You shoot a uh, person in black over a black background, you cannot pull a key off of that. So that person will have to be rotated out, uh, cut out, sort of frame by frame, possibly, and quite accurately. Um, animation department is animating the ship, the creature, whatever that needs to be. Um, the effects department, uh, as I was talking about before, the effects TD artist is creating the smoke elements, the artificial water, the artificial dynamics, things like that. The lighting department then gets that information, the match move, the virtual camera, the effects elements, the animation, all of that's coming down as well to the lighting department, and they are lighting the character with the new textures that are built. And obviously, all the shading information, how bright, how, how does that surface look when it's rendered out? Is it shiny? Is it glossy? Is it, is it matte? Is it furry? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it metal? All those types of things. And they are bringing all those elements together and lighting that. So directly, we get most of our elements then from the lighting department, the roto department, the matte painter as well. And then we are one of the most important, I think, certainly, because I'm a compositor. I enjoy it. <laughs> we are one of the very important parts because we're bringing all those together. Every part, every department as a collective works as a team. So it's never one department standing on their own. We bring that all together. And um, all of the elements prior to us getting it, the lighting department, the matte painting, the rotoscopy, all have been approved. So by the time we get it, then a lot of that is our final integration. And then obviously, it finally gets out to film as well. So uh, skills for getting into the compositing visual effects. So what types of roles um, do people kind of um, enter and what, what's important to sort of um, keep a lookout for? Um, the industry is certainly changing quite a lot. There's uh, certainly over the years, over the last 10 years, a lot of the larger companies have outsourced some of their entry-level positions, rotoscoping for compositing or for 2D types of work and also match move for 3D type of work. Um, but that still is fine, but there's still enough work um, in certainly in London and other, other cities as well. Um, so India is getting a lot of that outsourced work and China as well. But a lot of that work is then 
um, it's the volume of the work. They need to get through a lot of shots in a fairly quick time. What the shots that end up that stay, the match move shots, shots and the rotoscope shots that end up staying um, locally, so to speak, are the more difficult shots or the more challenging shots. So in a sense, you kind of got the cream of the crop of the shots. Um, you're, you're working with a team, if you're entry level for compositing uh, and rotoscoping, you're working with a team of uh, other artists, rotoscope artists, in the roto and paint and prep department in order to um, get feedback right away, which is very good. I think most companies in town, most of the larger companies, film companies, are still um, having a, a small department for entry level. That's still how they bring in artists, train them further, um, get them up to speed to learning their tools. There's some certainly proprietary tools that larger companies have built that they find um, are usually... Uh, faster and sometimes a bit easier to learn or very, very similar to existing third-party software. So people can pick those up quite easily. Um, so the role is, is uh, slightly changing in terms of maybe there's a bit less entry-level skills right now, but at the same time, there are more junior types of roles that have opened up as well. There's a lot of commercial work, a lot of um, industrial types of uh, visual effects as well in London and also in other cities as well. Vancouver's a big hot spot right now. Montreal's starting to get bigger. Um, that are using freelance work as well, uh, freelance artists to do commercial work. And they're looking for, an, uh, in terms of compositing, in terms of a 2D artist, they're looking for somebody who's got a good understanding of the initial skills, rotoscoping, and has also started to do or understand at least a bit of rig removal, paint and prep, things like that. So removing wires and other elements in the shot. Those are generally, again, still those initial core skills to really master and, and eventually do well and to start to move into uh, further, more complicated shots, like further keys and things like that, and CG comping. Um, so it's, it's a matter of understanding uh, the, the different types of of um, skills and and practicing practicing them quite a lot actually, um, a lot of people come out of the course knowing a really good broad understanding of rotoscoping, the two D skills, the rig removal, the keying. They understand a bit more which keyers to use for which type of shots, um, and then getting into the projections and learning. Ah, I can do a projection and I can clean up clean up and, and remove a wire or a rig or something in a slightly better way than, or a faster way than actually painting it out frame by frame. So it's building those skills that are going to make them more um, open and more viable for those junior types of roles. In the junior roles, you get a bit of, a bit of everything, which is great, because especially at entry level at the beginning of your career, you want to get exposed to a lot of different types of scenarios, a lot of different types of skills and different types of shots. So you can build your reel and build your skill set. One of the main things um, about uh, getting into the business and getting into the visual effects industry is problem solving, really understanding. Once you've got um, an initial understanding of the tools, certainly, and then also having uh, an initial list of how do I solve this, and we obviously go through certain types of solutions, and then starting to build, then thinking a bit out of the box from that and going, okay, how can I, I'm given this new shot, how can I solve and recreate um, a different area that's not working? So say, for instance, in this shot on the left here is the 2D comp, so these were CG renders of the car, but the background plate actually is a still image that has now been reprojected onto the geometry that's been built specifically to match this scene. And then you see there's textures that are getting stretched and all kinds of other problems that happen. So cleaning those up, you may approach them in one way, and then you start to build in your skills and go, how can I approach this in other ways that will make this really work well and also fit into the deadline that's necessary. So a lot of uh, junior compositors kind of um, start to go into freelance work or broadcast or TV work or industrials at the beginning because they generally have a much faster deadline. They usually, um, you get to work on a more, uh, more variety of shots in a much shorter time. Film work is a bit different in that sense that 
you get to work on a shot a bit longer, which sometimes is kind of nice because you really get your kind of dig your teeth into it and take it to a certain level that you may not have that time normally in broadcast work or TV work. Um, but it, to that extent, it's the amount of detail that you're adding. So your your attention to that detail and the skills and the and the problem solving to get to those solutions right. are going to be things that you start to build over time. Um, the rotoscoping is still one of the main things. They, almost any job you first get out of a course will be roto, even if it's for a week. Hopefully it's uh, for a short time, but sometimes you may need to work on that for a bit longer, depending if the, if the project needs quite a lot of roto. The more skills that you can get in those, and there's many, many, many other different ways to um, um, build your skills in that. Uh, learning hotkeys and things like that are really going to help you uh, build your speed and as well as your your variety. Cutting a person out versus cutting an animal out versus cutting a car, a building, all require slightly different approaches. And then learning all those different approaches will really help to, um, again, prove yourself in that first job so that you can move up to the different um, positions, junior comping and things like that. Um, stereo conversion prep work as well has been a very popular type of position for junior roles and entry level roles. So some of that again may be compo- uh, maybe rotoscoping and getting those all those elements to work together. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. So the software that is important is certainly Nuke, right? Uh, for also for camera tracking, that's another thing that uh, we go into as well. Um, again, a lot of compositors now more mid level and senior level compositors, but if it's a skill that you know as a junior, you've kind of got um, an edge over other people who don't know the skill of camera tracking, and that camera tracking is basically um, getting a plate that was shot with a moving camera, and then tracking in 2D points using the Nuke's camera tracker node to recreate the camera that actually shot the plate, so a 3D virtual camera in the sense in the end. Other software that uh, the other VFX courses go through are using 3D Equalizer, but Nuke has its own camera tracker, so then we're able to do all those types of very similar skills. Interface is fairly similar, and it's, it's certainly more than enough for a compositor. Um, the other skills as well, or the other software, is rotoscoping and the paint uh, for paint and prep. So um, Silhouette is a very common software that most companies have. Um, if they don't do the rotoscoping, or their paintwork in silhouette, then they certainly may use Nuke. So those are two things. Both, it's good to know both because some companies have their own software that may be based very similar on silhouette. So if you know silhouette, picking up their tools may be very, very quick. But both companies, uh, big and small, use both software quite equally. So training your eye, what's important? You've kind of got a good sense of what is compositing and you want to you know, take your skills further and you've been practicing and things like that, or you've taken a course and then you finish and you're kind of like, okay, I'm waiting for work, waiting for work, you've applied, things like that. Um, I think what is the most important thing is to just keep looking at a lot of different films. Go, go to the movies. It's as simple as that. Um, go see the big effects films. See what's, you know, the biggest trends and what's happening in terms of visual effects. You know, what are the new cool things that people want to do and want to see? Because what we see this year in this summer's movies, to a certain extent, maybe start filtering um, to uh, a lower level, so to speak, because of time, into TV commercials, right, or um, other industrial types of work. Um, and also they're building on then next year's summer blockbusters. Well, they go, well, if it's done in this year's, then they're going to have to take that to the next step and take it even further for next year's types of things. So it's a, ra- it's a matter of research, really, and that's the most fun part. Um, watch TV series. A lot of TV series now, broadcast series, really have a very high-end sense of visual effects. And that's one of the great ways, too, of really learning um, uh, lot of your skills in that for those first early jobs when you're trying to build your reel. Um, broadcast work has a very high standard now and the trick of that is to get that same high standard that everybody's aiming in films but in a much much shorter time. So broadcast work tends to be very good for learning um, so saying a lot of quick tricks and tips 
but getting those uh, shots to still look quite decent in the end. Um, I think what makes a good composite, uh, one of the important things that you want to think about is in the story, uh, what you, you know the general idea. Jen, if you're working on a film, you know generally what your sequence is about. So in your, in your particular shot that you're working on, what kind of image, what kind of story are you trying to tell? Is there an emotion that you're trying to convey in that particular image? All right. Um, you're given your elements, and sure, they've, to a certain point, they've been decided, but how, if you had your full creative say onto a shot, how would you then embellish your shot? How would you add your own ideas? You know, I think companies are really looking for certainly good skill at the beginning, but they also want to see your creative input. You know, and you're real, you have that chance to take a shot to a certain level, um, given the amount of time that you have, and to add your own ideas, to show your creative input. As a mid uh, compositor and certainly a senior, and then moving up to that from a lead compositor to a visual uh, 2D supervisor, and then eventually, if you're aiming for the visual effects supervisor, you, those are the people who are bringing those decisions and bringing those um, ideas and go, yes, I think we need to add smoke behind this character, or we need to add a little bit of smoke coming from the finger attaching to the forehead, those kinds of things. Right? Besides the director, you know, it's, it's a collaboration, it's a team effort to a certain extent. And the more ideas you have and the more you're able to start to technically execute those into your shot is really going to bring it all together and make your shot even more rich, and certainly for film. So I think that hopefully gave you a, a good overall kind of understanding of compositing and, and how that's a bit different from 3D and what's involved in a little quick peek at Nuke and also understanding where does compositing sort of sit and all of that. So um, if you've got any questions, I'd uh, love to try and help you out with any answers and see if you've got... Um, okay, so uh, one question's come in about um, how math-heavy is compositing, or I should say how, uh, how math-heavy is Nuke. Um, it can be, certainly, to understand some of the things. It can be as, as complex, and I'm, I'm being sarcastic here, but as, as pluses and minuses and divides. But it can also go even further. So you can take it um, on a lot of different levels. I think the certainly the more you start to understand um, what a node is doing and the operation that it's doing, and possibly later on, you know, and further in your career, what what um, type of math is going on behind that, the more power and the more uh, control you're going to have in your composite, and using the nodes to to its best benefit, really, and also using them creatively eventually. But at the beginning, you can just, you know, the, the important thing is about visually understanding and visually looking at your script and at your plate and starting to understand what do I need to do? How should I first remove this? Do I use this node or that node and things like that? So it's, um, you can approach it from many different ways. Um, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't say the mash should be something scary at the beginning. Um, again, it can be looked at at a lot of different levels. I think some people come in with a very math um, uh, sort of emphasis, you know, generally programmers a lot sometimes then um, approach it one way, and then we have other people come in for a much more artistic kind of way. Um, I'm a bit more artistic, you know, I've learned more about the math and understanding a bit more, but I certainly don't shy away from it. Um, good question is, um, how long does it take to pass the entry level um, in the industry? Part of that is up to you, certainly, and part of that is up to the type of company that you're in. If you're doing freelance, a lot of freelance work, you're probably, I would say, in general, tend to move a bit faster because uh, you are probably getting through a wider variety of different shots. But some people are really aiming for film work. So uh, when I started my career, I was really aiming for film work. Um, I did start it out on TV for quite a while, but I really... Uh, learn quite a lot of things. So it depends on the pacing of your own skill, how fast you're learning. I think one of the main things really is to just keep asking questions. You know, if you're in a job, whether it's a, a longer project, several months, you know, maybe on a film project, eight months or something or longer, or you're on a very short one-week project, you know, and you're sitting next to other compositors who have more experience or other roto artists who have been doing it, and you're finding, like, you know, you see something cool that they're working on, you go, hey, how'd you do that? You know, that's what, how you're going to learn really fast and how you're going to build your skills and show that you can do more advanced shots and then get eventually more full compositing shots. So um, part of that is up to you. It's really hard to say. I think in, in I've had people, some people say go into film 
uh, and then they maybe roto, they say, well, I've been rotoing for a year, um, and then they start to move into prep and paint roles and then junior compositing roles. I've had other people go in for maybe a few months, and they have an opportunity, and they've really taken that opportunity and kind of gone further, and maybe after six months or less, they've been doing prep and paint work. Um, so it really depends on, on your pacing and, and your enthusiasm. The more enthusiasm, the better and stuff. You're showing, obviously, that you're interested in learning. Um, interesting question, how to improve more um, to have a, a detailed eye. Kind of, um, I think, again, by looking at, by watching films or watching broadcast shows that have a lot of effects, and you say, you see a shot and you go, oh, this doesn't, that doesn't quite look very good. Um, if you can stop, <laughs> pause it, so to speak, and take a look at it and decide and uh, take a look and kind of and that, analyze it and go, why is it not working? What's not working? Is it perspective? Is it the color? Is it the lighting? Um, it, it, that will start to help to break down the different parts of the shot, and then you'll, you'll start to look at your shot in a much more detailed way, which is really good. Another way to really improve your, your kind of training of your eyes, in a sense, your training of your compositing of what's a good composite, what, what's a it's a not so great composite. How can you prove it? It's actually to take, um, if you have uh, access to other elements and things like that, there's quite a few elements that are free as well online, um, to recreate the shot, right? to build together if, the, if there is a final comp that you can reference to, how did they get to that stage? So by, by imitating the masters, in a sense, is one of the best ways because you really start to break down every single element. And that's really, really important to understand what goes into that shot. And that, that amount of detail will really train your eye in a very quick way. Um, good questions about Shake and Nuke. I started out in Shake as well. well. I started out in other software prior to that, but then I did move on to Shake. And Nuke, Nuke is, it was sort of redesigned um, version 5, I believe, uh, a few years ago to really be a little bit more similar in terms of the no names and things like that to Shake. So a lot of uh, a lot of my colleagues who, again, started as Shake as well were starting to move over to Nuke a few years ago, and as companies in London were starting to move over, everybody was kind of going, okay, how do you run this thing, right? Um, I think you'll find that the initial ideas are, are pretty much the same, but there are a lot more buttons in Nuke, and that's where it can get kind of daunting. I think to start out at the beginning is just the very the simplest thing. Just do what seems familiar, and there are there is documentations in terms of what are the same nodes that are in shake and what's the equivalent to nuke. A lot of them are called the same, but some of them are slightly different. Um, another good question, too, is it essential to learning CG lighting and effects uh, modeling to kind of embellish or, you know, add to the compositing work? I think it's helpful. I think I find uh, definitely that students who come in with some 3D background, they are able to pick up the 3D side of nuke a bit faster, but it's not required, no. Um, I think, again, understanding... And having a good, strong visual artistic sense is what is most important. I think um, adding uh, adding those other skills later on is certainly going to help and certainly going to improve your shots because you'll start to look at a shot and go, ah, okay, this maybe I may do in Maya, and then this other aspect will be much faster, much easier to do in Nuke. So it's a lot of it's, it's starting to be a little bit of a combination. And again, it's the the 3D side of things that we're using to kind of embellish our shot, not to replace what, what it does. Um, paint and prep. Um, I think paint and prep, sorry, I kind of whizzed through that bit. Paint and prep is the next stage that is after rotoscoping. So painting and, and preparing plates. Painting uh, may be actually painting out a wire, literally, from your shot frame by frame. Generally, those types of shots are quite difficult, very time-consuming, very, uh, very, very detail-oriented. So they may be uh, like a wire that's over cloth that's pulling the actor, you know, as they fly through the air, things like that. So when you've got an element underneath the wire, like cloth and things like that, um, that's constantly changing, um, you may have to then uh, take your new clean shirt, so to speak, and then warp it and paint it and, move, and kind of reposition it to get it to really match and to get that wire removed. Um, prep department is just an extension of that. So prep is just the, the broader kind of sense of bringing that all together. Um, removing wires, removing markers uh, from green screens. Uh, quite often, you've got you know, somebody with big uh, 
flowing hair and all that hair is going over the green markers or the sorry, black markers on the green screen, things like that. So you've got to remove those markers so when that person's keyed, they don't have these sort of markers showing through all of their nice blonde hair, things like that. So those are all about prepping the plate. And I call them, that's why they call that the paint and prep department. So um, excellent questions. Um, I think uh, it's uh, you've got a good understanding of kind of what we went through. And thanks for joining.